Change to begin with, but but it will make sense. Um, I'll just. <laughs> I've got a bit of stuff on my glasses. My apologies about that. Oh, it's better. I can read every every word, not every third word now. That's good. <laughs> so I'm just going to start at Hebrews 4, verse 14, and go through to 5, verse 10. Therefore we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, and let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathise with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin. So let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. And every high priest is selected from among men and is appointed to represent them in matters related to God and to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. That is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honour upon himself. He must be called by God, just as Aaron was. So Christ also did not take upon himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I've become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. And during the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with loud cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience from what he had suffered. And once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who uh, obey him and was designated by God to be the high priest in the order of Melchizedek. There's a lot in that and I'm not going to go anywhere near uh, exploring all of that. Suffice to say a few words. Last Sunday, we had Palm Sunday here. And we're reminded of the entrance of, of, of a king into Jerusalem. It was not quite the entrance fit for a king. A king wouldn't ride on a donkey, but for a servant king. Yes, it was. And Hebrews 5, verses 5 and 6, denotes the entrance of the king. This time, it's the entrance of the king of kings. This passage combines two amazing um, Psalms together, Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. Both of these are declarations of God to Jesus the Son, the, the eternal Son of God. In Psalm 2 verse 7, You are my Son, uh, today I've become your Father. In Psalm 110, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. What does Melchizedek mean? Melchizedek means king of peace and king of righteousness held together at once. That is who King Jesus is, the king of righteousness and the king of peace together. But it seems almost like foolishness. Why would which was what we explored last week, wasn't it? The foolishness of the cross. Why would Jesus, the King of, King of kings and, and the Son of God and the Son of Man, enter into, enter into Jerusalem, enter into a, a place where he was judged and accused wrongly? And then sentenced to death and he died on a cross. It seemed complete foolishness. 
But here we encounter a remarkable, this is a big word, juxtaposition. So these are two, two positions which are in complete opposite to, to each other and yet they are held together. How that works is, is something else again. On one side we have the high Christology, I'm going to use that word, of, of, of the book of Hebrews, which, which declares Jesus that he's, he's greater than all the prophets, he's greater than all the angels, uh, he's greater than anything else, for he is the Son, he is the image. He bears the image. How does, how does Hebrews 1 begin? In the past, God spoke of our forefathers through the prophets of many times in various ways. But in his last days, he's spoken to us by his son, whom he was appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So we have this side, this juxtaposition, this, this, this position of, of who Christ is, that he is the son. The, the eternal son of God, the eternal son of man, that Daniel, as we saw in Daniel 7, all those things which, which, which we understand. And then on the other side, we then have a man beaten on a cross with a crown of thorns embedded in his skull, naked, hanging there, so we have this remarkable two positions which are complete opposite yet held together. A juxtaposition. And it's, the, it's this thing that, that Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews wants to really bring out that a man Jesus who suffered a, a difficult life and a painful death, these two elements are then held together. One thing, however, is certain, the vulnerability of Jesus in the days of his, days of his flesh reveals a gracious God, as Hebrew states. Having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey, or the word trust, him. Because he's been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, the king of peace and the king of righteousness held together. With Jesus' elevation to the right hand of God, the demand for blood sacrifice is extinguished, as is the need for humans to suffer to, to, suffer to, to, suffer to perfection. I'm going to put it out here, I am not a perfectionist. Robin will attest to that. I try to get things right. I try to get things right. I am very trying, aren't I, my dearest? Yes. <laughs> but imagine if you're caught in, in, a, in a situation where you wanted everything to be perfect all the time, every time, and had to be make sure it's perfect and had to be all lined up. Like, it, it becomes controlling becomes controlling. Imagine if that's what you had to do to actually gain your salvation, had to do everything right, everything so, um, had to be everything per perfect and, and done the right way and had to have everything, like make sure you get the clothes done the right way and put everything the right way. Oh no, I'm just a fraction bit out, I've got this bit out or that bit out and I'm, uh, I failed. Are we recording at the moment? I will say this, I work with a Muslim Imam and he is so strident at this time in Ramadan, at this time in Ramadan and he's strident to try and keep everything right and in order and doing the right thing, the right time, the right place. Oh my goodness, it is exhausting and he is exhausted and it's only halfway through. Yet the, the bearing, the weight of all that, why? What is the purpose? To please Allah? Really? 
Christians, we have one who has already satisfied God's wrath. We already have one who's already done that. So we're liberated from such obligations and we're freed through Christ to trust anew in the mercy of God, to trust in the gracious God. Then lies at the very heart of obedience to God and demands something different. And this demand is encountered more often in the gift of faith. And such faith is understood neither as the belief in the existence of God, because as James, we remember the book of James, he says, demons believe in God. They know he exists. And in fact, wasn't it that when we've been going through the Gospel of Mark, what do all the demons do when, they, when they've been thrown out of people? They're wanting to declare, you are, the son of, you, you are the son of God. So they certainly believe, they certainly know. But they don't have a relationship with, with God. And it's nor, nor is it just a merely intellectual um, assent to some form of doctrine. Rather, faith is understood in terms of continually tested belief in God's goodness and mercy. So what is doubt? Doubt is in the mirror image of faith. Doubt is not disbelief in the existence of God, but the suspicion that mercy is not to be found in God's innermost heart. I don't. I, I doubt that you could ever say, I don't think you really care for me, God. I, I, I don't think you're good enough. I think I've got to find a different way. It's not that I don't know that you're there, the big man in the sky, doing something and doing something around. I, uh, But I'll get Joe Blow to pray for me because he does that and I don't. Because I don't think God's good enough for me. Maybe I don't think I'm good enough for God. However, what we find is Jesus, who is the one who is gentle in his dealings with us. With our sin, with our shame and with our guilt. And he's the one who, who has been selected by God to do for this very purpose and he was the one who was sent by God out of love for this world and if you pause to think well what's love for this world mean um, there are some who have taken it to the extreme example of that if there's no one else on the world apart from me then that's who he would die for But then we expand it out and we realise that we're in a community. We realise that we're in a larger population. We realise that there's so many, seven billion, is that we're up to people at the moment, the world's population at the moment? And what has the population been for all of, uh, all of humankind? It's a lot. So Jesus was just sent for you. For Jesus, we're going to sing of this. Jesus is strong and kind and we can come to him. Jesus is strong and kind and we can come to him. We're going to sing of this. And it's a, it's a song which has been put together by uh, Colin Buchanan. <laughs> Ba ba do ba ba, <laughs> that man, <laughs> um, and also with City of Light, and um, John and Jenny have been rehearsing this. Uh, I was going to play it through through my speaker, but uh, John and Jenny have been, been been rehearsing through this, and would really love you to come and and uh, share. And we might just listen first of all, and then we can sing together. Is that would that sound go? I don't know. I think you could probably. The introduction is the tune, yeah. so they can just follow along with that. Yeah. Jesus, strong and calm. Jack, could you? Jack, could you? 
Yep.